Um, yeah. And so I emailed Simon just kind of on a whim while I was in Indonesia, um, jet lagged and thought that it would be cool if um, he was able to speak to our class. And it, within the first email, he agreed, which was really surprising. I don't know why I thought maybe podcast producers would be more intimidating than they are. Um, but they're, they're very nice people, too. Um, and so he is very uh, graciously agreed to kind of talk about how Radio Lab puts together their podcasts and kind of targets the general public. But a lot of their podcasts are on kind of current science trends or kind of philosophical questions that kind of are pretty deep and they're trying to repackage them for a way that the general public finds interesting and whatnot. Um, you guys, I mean, just in case some of you guys aren't aware, Radio Lab um, in 2007 got the National Academy's Communication Award for its imaginative use of radio to make science accessible to broad audiences. And in 2010 and 2014, they got the Peabody Awards uh, for their podcast, which I'm pretty sure is basically like the Oscars podcast. Um, so they do a very good job. And I'll pass it over to Simon and mute ourselves now. Is it? It is yeah. recording. Yep. Yes, he does. <laughs> yes. All right, cool. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. Good to see all of your happy faces this uh, this afternoon. Uh, so yeah, I, like I guess I'm more interested in having a discussion than me lecturing about anything in particular, but a little bit about what we are, what we do, and what I do specifically for the show. So yeah, as was mentioned, we're we're a, we're like a radio documentary program. Uh, so if you think like I think like feature writing for a magazine turned into the audio form or uh, like a film documentary turned into the audio form. And particularly what we try to do is we try to find stories that uh, are filled with narrative tension. So like any movie or television show that you watch, they're creating a story that makes you want to stick around, makes you want to listen to what's or watch what's going to happen next. But not just that, in our stories as well, we're, we're trying to explore some question typically. Uh, typically through the characters or through the individual story that, we, uh, that, we're, that we're telling. So I think the best example of that was a couple of years, or one, of, one example of this is I did a story several years back profiling uh, this uh, Texas oil tycoon who also happened to be a trophy hunter. And uh, essentially, he went to Namibia, he, or he, he paid $350,000 uh, and bought the right to shoot an endangered rhino in Namibia. And essentially, the story then is uh, from like the moment he buys this thing through to him shooting the thing, exploring the question like, okay, on its face, this guy seems like a total asshole who is doing terrible things for the world, but is that the case? So it becomes this exp exploration of what is conservation in the 21st century and how do things as sort of uh, unintuitive or ironic as killing animals, how, do, how does that feed back into protecting them? Now, uh, specifically what I do here is I split my time about 50-50 between being a reporter and being a producer. So that means half my time I'm reading, calling people, conducting interviews, and then half the time, essentially, I'm taking all of that tape that we get and turning it into the thing that you hear. And that's a very long process where we'll do sort of draft after draft after draft of the story um, until we think it gets to a point that we want the world to hear it. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit of what I do, uh, what we do. And I, I guess, yeah, let's I open it up for questions or, or some sort of discussion. You guys can kind of direct what you want, what you want out of me. OK, cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, does anybody, our first burning question. Yes, go ahead. Um, wait, why don't you introduce yourself? Like, yeah. Uh, OK, hi, my name is Carolina. Hi, Carolina. <laughs> So I guess I was just wondering, um, with podcasts, you only have like the ability to hear like voices and sound. So like I guess, um, how do you find that? I guess challenging or unique um, if you don't have um, written words or any visuals or anything like that. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's why it like. Uh writing for radio and storytelling in radio is obviously different than in other forms. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is take moves that are being done in film 
uh, or in, in film documentary, typically actually film, we're looking to, to good television shows or movies and figure out like what are the storytelling devices they're using and how can we uh, sort of recreate those in an audio, uh, in a, just a purely audio, audio medium. Uh, so like an example of that is like a, one of my colleagues here was, was watching the opening scene to uh, There Will Be Blood which is this just, uh, it, it opens up to this panoramic shot of, I'm guessing it's Western Texas. Uh, and uh, it then goes into this story of this man like picking at the ground, trying to find oil. And so the question became like, is there a way to create a sort of sonic representation of a place like, uh, like, a, like a desert landscape? And how do we do that in a way that feels uh, authentic to a degree, also uh, subtle? Uh, and I think what ended up being done was like there was some tape of somebody, one of our reporters who was out in the desert sort of walking through it and you just hear them breathing and you hear the wind blowing through the microphone. And then like maybe a little, little bit of music comes in to nod even further to the fact that, okay, we're in the Southwest. This is where this story is going to take place. The desert is a character in and of itself in this piece. Uh, so essentially it, it, it's, a, it's a strange act of translation from, from one medium to another. Uh, but like just a, as a practical note, one thing we're always trying to do uh, in audio is give you the listener something to look at, uh, which is sort of counterintuitive. But uh, like we, we think of it that we're making movies for your ears. And in those movies, like you got to be able to see exactly what's happening. And we're, uh, we're uh, or you need to be able to imagine exactly what's happening. And we're using different sounds or we're using different people's voices. Uh, or a variety of different techniques, which I could go into or not go into, uh, to accomplish that. I have a question. I'm Kylie. Um, Hi, Kylie. I have a question going off of that. Uh, I listened to the Black Rhino mm -hmm. um, podcast, and there's a lot of um, background sounds just to like, put yourself into the mood, whether it was the auctioneer or whether they were going out to actually down a rhino how do you get those recordings without recording like every step of your day or do you do that like how do you determine what time do you break out a recorder yeah i'm just all like we're we're just always rolling um and so yeah it's a pain in the ass uh, <laughs> like i did a piece uh couple months back following this city council, New York City Council candidate around for, uh, it was a profile of this guy and I followed him around for about eight months. And at the end of it, I had like 100 or 120 hours of tape that was eventually cut down to an 80 minute story. So yeah, we're just like, we're always recording in the hopes that you, uh, that you can capture some tiny little moment that, that in fact captures the idea you're trying to explain. I am Kara. Um, it seems like you're trying to be as unbiased as possible when you're presenting these uh, stories, but how do you keep that unbiased, especially if you're doctoring into some kind of a story format? Yeah, that's a really good question. I the like I don't know I don't know if unbiased is the is the right way to talk about it. Um, what we're doing is we're telling a story, and a story inherently has a point of view. And uh, it inherently has uh, some sort of agenda. Like we're manipulating you as the listener in very specific moments to feel very specific things or ask very specific questions. And like that's the actual craft of the production process is like how can we take this sort of mountain of tape and sculpt it into something uh, where, where, where you as the listener have an experience. And I think what we try to do is with everyone we talk to, to meet them uh, simultaneously in a generous way where, where we actually want to hear what they're saying and we want to understand them, but at the same time in a very critical way where it's my job as an interviewer to stand in for you, the listener, and ask the question that though it may be uncomfortable in the moment is the question that needs to be asked. And so I guess we're constantly we're constantly forcing ourselves to stare logically at the things that people are saying and see if they make sense. 
And if they don't make sense, we're going to tell you it doesn't make sense. But if it does, and we can't argue our way out of it, even if it feels wrong to us in some way, we're going to present that. And I think th that's one thing I love about the Rhino Hunter uh, story is like, here's a guy that you really hate at the get go. You're, we, we, and we sent you up to hate him. And yet at the end, like I, if we did our job right, like you're, you certainly, you, you might like the guy. And if you don't like him, at least you uh, think he's reasonable. Whereas you probably thought he was off his rocker in the first 10 minutes of the piece. Uh, so I think it's, I don't know if it's about bias or, I think it's about just critically engaging with the ideas. And you as the listener, essentially as a listener to a show like Radio Lab or This American Life or any number of documentary programs, like you, 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 as, an, you as a listener are saying like, I trust you to manipulate me. I trust mm -hmm. you to play with my emotions in a way that will be fair uh, to me and to the people you're presenting. Um, and that's how I look at it. And I try to, I try to keep that in mind. Does that make sense? Or if you yeah. want to clarify, I can try. Okay. Hi, I'm Benson. I'm Valerie. Um, how, like, what do you use before you go into, um, like, creating the podcast? Do you have, like, a storyboard or, like, like a script or how, or does it just kind of come naturally when you go in? Yeah, so the process is, um, so let's say I go and report a piece for a couple months. What I'm going to be doing while I'm reporting is taking all that tape. So typically an interview we do here is about 90 minutes long. I'm going to take that 90 minute interview and, uh, and cut it down to like a 20 minute uh, set of selects as we call them. And that's sort of like the hot, hot tape from the, from the interview as well as sort of like a presentation of like the arc of the interview. So let's say after two months of reporting, I've done 10 interviews. I've got 10 interviews that are now cut down to 20 minutes long. And at that point, I'm going to go back and I'm going to listen to everything. My editors uh, are going to listen to everything. And if I have another producer who's going to be working with me, they're going to listen to everything. Everything meaning the selects that we have cut. From there, then it becomes this sort of, uh, we, we call it a storyboarding session. And essentially, like, we just go around the room telling each other what we think the story is. Like, I think we start so back in 2015, but then, and so to understand this, you got to back up, bah, 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 bah. and we just do that sort of around the room over and over again until we start to land on a structure that sound that that seems like it's going to work. And by work, I mean like that the, we can do it with the tape, um, that it's honest. First and foremost, more than that, that it that the emotional moves that we're trying to make, the ways we're trying to make you feel, we have the tape to do it. And like what one thing that sets us apart from other shows is brief tangent is just how much we lean on tape. Like This American Life, for example, I would guess seventy percent of the of the words you hear in an episode are are tracked narration, whereas I would say in our episodes it's closer to. 30% or 40%. Um, but anyway, so once we have what, what feels like a structure, we lay that out on paper, just super basic, like the basic beats of the story. Like we start here, we meet this person here, then this happens, this is because of that, the end. And then essentially it becomes this, this game of uh, running into all of the problems that you didn't predict uh, when you built this storyboard or this roadmap for yourself. So obviously like you're it's never going to translate perfectly. You're never going to have foreseen all of the potential problems you're going to run into uh, when you're writing that storyboard. And so then we're just constantly revising or trying new ways, new structures, either macro or micro, uh, to present the ideas in an order that is both compelling uh, and, and hopefully uh, informative. So it, like, and, and I'll say, like when an episode that we do, in most cases we go through like 20 or 30 iterations. Like we remake the episode 20 or 30 times before uh, it never goes out. So you're just guessing. You're constantly guessing until you get to a place that you, that you feel like you've landed in the right spot. So what's kind of the average, like you decide this is a topic for a podcast that you're going to work on. And then that final product is that, is that like, a year in the making or is that often 
Yeah, no, it, it totally, totally, totally varies. Um, I would say on, yeah, it's so hard to even give an average because like the episode we just put out, um, essentially we threw together in three days, which we had never done before. Like prior to this, the quickest thing we've ever turned around was a month. Um, but I would say on average, the stuff I work on uh, or I have worked on, it's typically like three months of reporting. Uh, and then you're looking at like a month or two months of production. So you're gathering your tape for three months and then you're making the actual thing for two. Tip, like, again, it can be totally different than that, but that's some sort of average. I'm going to pop in with one more. Um, specific to kind of the podcast that you guys do with related to the sciences. Mm -hmm. I guess in working with the scientists, first off, is it, is it tough to, to get them to commit to kind of taking a scientific finding or advance in technique and turning that into a story that are, I guess, like in the sciences, what is your approach to kind of take Chris, I mean, your podcast on CRISPR, let's say, or something like that. Like, what, what is your guys' approach to, to taking something that's very technically complicated and maybe a scientist that is very knowledgeable and turning that into something that's digestible for the, the general public and interesting for the general public? Right, yeah. Um, and it, it's not just in sciences, but in any interview I go into, like, you just have to be dumb. Like you have to like, and you have to be really certain of the things you don't understand that they're saying. So then you can clearly articulate a question that, that answers that for you. Cause uh, yeah, a lot of times people are particularly if it's a, if it's a technical issue, uh, they're talking about it with a, with a fluency that nobody outside their field has obviously. So it's your job as the interviewer or as the producer to, uh, to be the idiot in the room and force them to articulate it in a way that even the dumbest person who's going to be listening to the podcast would be able to understand. Um, and also so you can truly understand it because not only are we talking to these people and using their voice to explain what the ideas are, but we're intercutting our own voices. So I need to really clearly understand, uh, let's say if, I don't know, like I keep coming back to the rhino hunter, but I, I, I need to actually understand uh, the, the history of Namibia's conservation policy uh, to be able to talk about it in a, in a, in an educated, let alone compelling way. So it's really about you in the moment, uh, very, very critically listening to the person and then quickly coming up with a question that resolves the issue that you're, you're feeling yourself have, which is, which I think is just a great skill to have in general. Um, yeah, just like being a very, very active listener. And it's also about like knowing when you're bored. Like that, that's one thing that we're always trying to do because we're trying to make stuff that's interesting and fun, right? Like we're, we're not going to put something out if it's not interesting. And so it, it, part of the job is to also just know what I'm interested in, what I'm curious about, what I find a modicum of wonder in, uh, and then to chase that. And uh, it's through the act of very critical listening and like deep critical awareness of, of my own emotional states as I'm taking in information that, I, that I'm able to then hone in on not only what I don't understand, but what I do truly find interesting. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a deep act of listening. Cool. Sure. Um, so you, I guess you were mentioning before a little bit about how you've been doing these interviews for months. So I guess, how long does it take you to do one podcast and I guess do you have like multiple going at a time how do you I guess get the idea and then run it through to the end product and how long yeah so again it, it totally varies but I'd say about like five to six months is probably a decent average and so we've got what like six to eight producers on staff at the moment uh, and a typical story is going to have two producers on it um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, and so we're, we're sort of always trying to have three or four things at different phases of the production process so that when we put one episode out, 
it's not like we're starting back at square one and having to do in two weeks all this work, but rather we've got a piece that's like 50% or 60% of the way sort of produced. And then it becomes like polishing at the end, those last two weeks. That very rarely happens. And we're constantly uh, sprinting to try to find the next thing or sprinting to try to finish the thing that needs to come out next. Uh, but yeah, in a perfect world, it's like this machine that has different, different stories moving at different paces through different forms of the production process. But yeah, it's a shit show most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, hi, I'm Chelsea. Um, quick question about kind of cutting down the interviews that you were talking about. If you have hours and hours of interviews and you're cutting them down to 20 minutes, kind of how do you do that and decide what portions of the interviews you want to keep and kind of how do you maintain um, kind of the integrity of what whoever you're interviewing, what they're saying by cutting it down? Yeah, so there are a couple... I think when you cut down an interview from 90 minutes to 20 minutes, there, there are sort of two competing, uh, two competing goals that, that you have. One is to uh, preserve the character of the person as much as possible. And by that, I don't even necessarily mean what they said, but sort of how they said it, their giggles, their, uh, the moments where they pause to think. If, they're, if like you as the interviewer have a nice back and forth or rapport with the person, that's important to capture and maintain. And then the other thing you're trying to do is you're trying to cram in as much information into those 20 minutes as possible, right? Uh, as many different ideas as, as you can. And it, it's, a, it's an impossible balance in that you're always going to feel like stuff that you left on the cutting room floor should have made it into that little 20 minute cut. Uh, but the act of keeping them both, both those priorities in your head as you're moving through the tape, I think is the best way to approach it. And how I do it is, to take a 90 minute interview, I just listen through it from beginning to end the first time. And I'm literally cutting and pulling down the moments I like, very liberally. So uh, typically after my first pass through a 90 minute interview, I'll have about 40 minutes of tape that I pulled as my favorite parts, my favorite 40 minutes. And then from there, what I do is I'll sort of go through it and, and, and listen through it front to back again and start reordering things. Because what often happens in, in an interview um, is you're going to have a lot of the same ideas repeated uh, throughout different parts of the interview or even in quick succession. And so if, I don't know, what, uh, what's an example here? So I was talking with these content moderators in the Philippines, folks who essentially it's their job to, uh, if you flag something on Facebook, uh, as inappropriate, it gets sent to Manila and somebody sitting behind a computer then has that image come across them and they have to click, yes, this is inappropriate or no, this is not inappropriate. And so like throughout the course of my interview with this guy, I, I like came at him four times with essentially variations of the same question. Like, wait, so what, what does it look like in your office? Like I'm trying to actually imagine when you're sitting at your computer, what this looks like. So throughout the 90 minutes, that's so, that question is speckled through. After I've pulled the 40 minutes of tape down, I start rearranging things so I have like, okay, here are my four takes of the guy answering this question. Maybe the four takes add up to a total of four minutes long, but he kind of says the same thing each time. I'm gonna be able to cut that down uh, to a minute or a minute and a half, sort of scrambling together the best uh, versions of him explaining that. And so after going through it a second time, you've reordered things, uh, then you just start hacking stuff down and you can usually get it down to 20 minutes. Uh, like it's sort of amazing in a 90 minute conversation. Uh, yeah, you don't, oftentimes you don't actually need that much more than 20 minutes to get the may, like the majority of the substance of the conversation. I hope that's not true with what I'm saying right now. I'm hoping if uh, this is ever cut down, it would be hard to get it down to 20 minutes, but Lord knows. Hi, um, I'm all the way in the back. <laughs> My name is Elizabeth. I was just wondering, how do you go about researching uh, a topic to, uh, I guess, combine the podcast? Yeah, so like the reporting process or like the ideation, like how do we come up with, with stories? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's really hard. Uh, because they're like for something to work as a radio lab story, and this isn't true of all 
podcast or documentary programs, but like it ha- there are a certain number of boxes that need to be checked. Like you got to have a character. You have to have a character that had something interesting happen to them. And uh, then that interesting, unexpected thing that happened to them has to lead to some uh, unexpected, interesting consequence. So like that's box one. And that's sort of uh, narr- the, the building blocks or the foundation of the narrative tension that I talked about before. Like you need to have something happen that causes something to make you give a damn about whatever the hell this person has experienced. On top of that, then, like, they have to be able to tell their story in an interesting way so that you feel like you can emotionally engage with them. Uh, And then on top of that, like, there has to be, as I said before, like, a question that you're exploring. And you need to have, like, you, you need or I need to be able to articulate very clearly, like, I want to do this story because I'm curious about blah, 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 blah. And so there are various ways you can uh, approach uh, trying to check all those boxes or finding something that checks all those boxes. One is I come up with a question on my own that I'm like, oh, I'm really curious about like content moderation. I was like, why is it such a hard problem to solve uh, the misinformation, uh, the, the rampant misinformation on these social media platforms? Why is that such a hard problem to solve? And that led me to go uh, find a bunch of people who are thinking about this and doing this and, uh, and are trying to solve it and could explain it to me. And through that, I bumped into people that have a story like the one I mentioned before, that something strange happens to them and then they do something strange in return. The other way is you just, uh, like you just, you, you can start with a character, like you find somebody who's interesting, like the, the piece I did about the city councilman, like, a year before I even started reporting that piece, I reached out to the guy because I had read an article about him and I thought he was interesting. And we like, would get coffee every couple months. And then from there, as your report, once I started reporting out the story, it's figuring out what is the question that I'm actually exploring through this. Uh, but in essence, like a, at its most basic, it's just about input. Like you have to be reading a lot. You have to be uh, talking to a lot of people. You have to be just sort of aware you're like you're trying to soak up as much of the world as you can to then be able to uh figure out or feel what in all of that mess is the most interesting or the most confusing to you um but like if i'm if i have a day where i'm just reporting and by reporting i mean like looking for a story if i'm if i'm hunting for stories i just have sort of a checklist that i go through like i'd need to read five articles i need to make two phone calls and i need to schedule two more phone calls uh, and if I do that, it becomes a numbers game. And if I do that enough days in a row, I know I'm eventually going to stumble into something that gets me excited, but it's really hard. It's really, really hard. Um, so my name is Sienna. I was kind of wondering, have you like, like approached like the people say like, you, like, you want to do something like this story? And sorry, do you mind? Sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but can you talk a little bit louder? I can't quite hear you. Um, so I was like wondering, like, how do you kind of approach like, interviewing people? So, like, say, like, you're, you want to interview someone for like a specific story, and like they're hesitant, or they kind of like decline you. Like, how do you kind of respond? Them? Yeah. So uh, the question is like, how do who, how do you get people to agree to talk, and then how do you sort of make them comfortable throughout the interviewing process to talk about the things that you want to talk about? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's weird. It's uh, it totally depends. It depends on. Who who they are, it depends on what they're, uh, why they're feeling ambivalent about whether they want to talk to you or not in the first place. Um, and then for me, it, 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 it's, it's about um, getting out in front of those concerns that they have and uh, to a degree convincing them in a way that is slightly manipulative but not uh, maliciously manipulative that they should talk to you. Um, so for example, there's this guy Judd Hoffman, who was Facebook's head of global policy. Uh, He was the guy who essentially wrote the rule book for what is allowed to be on Facebook. Guy with a ton of power, guy with a story that I think is fascinating and that I haven't heard many people talk about. Like, this is the guy I want to get. And we have this wonderful phone call together. Like, I don't even bring up the possibility of, of talking on the record. And then at the end of this hour and a half on the phone, I'm like, so by the way, would you be comfortable talking on the record? Like, could we sort of have this conversation again but record it and he says like I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that like I've really enjoyed this conversation uh I'm just like 
I'm worried that I'm going to look uh, like I'm Monday morning quarterbacking here if I talk about what Facebook's doing. And more than that, like the company I work for now, and he worked for Pinterest, he was worried that they are going to, like he doesn't want what he says about Facebook to in any way hurt Pinterest. And so what I did was I was like, I totally understand that. Uh, if nothing else, can we just plan to talk again? Because I'm sure I'll have more questions off the record. And he says, sure. Get, shoot me an email with some time to talk. And so then what I do is I spend like two and a half hours crafting an email uh, where in the first paragraph I set up, I propose some time to talk. But then like the real heart of it is like, this is, I'm pitching him on why he should go on the record. And I'm addressing point by point the issues that he had when not wanting to do so. And obviously doing so in a, in a, a transparent way, uh, like, a, and like winking at the fact that I'm pitching you on this and I know that you know that I'm trying to get you to do something you don't want to do. Uh, but really just leveling with them. And I guess when I'm trying to get people to talk on the record in general, I'm trying to use transparency and authenticity uh, as a tool to get people to talk, um, which is sort of an odd thing because uh, it's not particularly authentic to use authenticity in a calculated way, but uh, it works. Uh, uh, and then as to like being on the record with someone, it's this weird act of sort of feeling it out in the moment. Uh, because the things that the people don't that people don't want to talk about are typically the things that are the most interesting. So it becomes this game of you like walk the conversation closer and closer to whatever the question is that you really want to ask, and then you feel them sort of bristle, so you back up and you move somewhere else. But then again, you push back on it, and then in the last twenty percent of the interview is like, hopefully you've warmed them up to the idea of talking about this. Hopefully they trust you a bit at that point. Hopefully you are trustworthy at that point, and. Uh, yeah, you just got to sort of hit them with the question. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Denise. Um, my question is, are you working on or have worked on before on a story that really relates to you? And how does that experience? A story that really relates to me. Hmm. Uh, and when you say that, do you mean... Yeah, I guess, uh, can you clarify the question a little bit? Like, uh, like one that resonated emotionally with me or, or yeah, what, what exactly, what, what, what exactly do you mean? I guess it can be like really anything, like, like a theme or like a personal experience that kind of was similar. Yeah, well, like, I guess what, what I'm, I'm lucky in that my job, uh, like every story I go after is because I'm actually curious about some aspect of it and occasionally I'll have to help produce a story for someone else that I'm not all that interested in but I think every story I've certainly every story I have uh I've reported was was, was personally meaningful in some way because I just got to learn a lot uh and sort of satisfy a, a, a genuine curiosity um recently I did a story that I got to do with my dad which was really fun uh, so like that just on a very personal level was very, was very satisfying and it was just cool to hear his voice on the radio. Uh, but yeah, I, I think like hopefully in the, like whatever field you all end up going into, like hopefully whatever you're doing does satisfy you both intellectually and emotionally, uh, hopefully on like a regular basis. I think that's what everybody should be striving for. And I, I, I'm very lucky in that my job does that for me. So Simon, this is Chris. As a faculty instructor of the class here, I'm confident that every single one of my students is dying to ask you this question. Okay. Uh, you know, the class is skills for public engagement, and we've been talking a lot about audiences. Mm -hmm. and and you need to know your audience when you're going to engage with them. So how do you guys gauge an audience and who is your audience? Yeah, interesting question. Um, I'm trying to figure out how honest to be here. Uh, <laughs> Authenticity, Simon. Authenticity. Right, yeah, yeah. Maybe even that question was planned by me to make you trust me more. Uh, yeah. no, I, it, it, it's really... I'll, I'll say two ends of the spectrum here, right? 
one end of the spectrum is uh, we do have an audience and it is uh, reliably college educated uh, and reliably liberal, uh, or at least skews democratic. Uh, we, we know that about our audience. We know what they want to hear. Um, and we know sort of how far we can push them. Uh, so we're sort of always keeping that in mind. Like we want to challenge the audience uh, within reason. Uh, because if we challenge them too much, uh, there can be backlash, nobody's happy, we come off sounding tone deaf. So there's, there's that calculation being made of like, we, got, we, gotta, we can't do too much here. But at the same time, there's sort of the Miles Davis approach which when Miles Davis in his later years would play, like he'd go up on stage and he would, instead of having a microphone in front of him, looking out at the audience that he'd play into, he'd have a microphone like on the ground uh, at the back of the stage and he'd just turn his audience or turn his back to the audience and play into his microphone. Uh, sort of saying, fuck you, I'm gonna do my thing. If you wanna listen to it, you can. not And so there's like, there's a, there's like a swagger to that and there's a, a confidence that like, what I find interesting uh, will be interesting to people. Uh, that clearly, if you do that too much, you're gonna come across as an asshole and you probably are an asshole. But uh, like, there, there's a degree of that that needs, to, that needs to be inside of you as well when, we're f when you're figuring out what it is you wanna spend six months of your life uh, learning about. Uh, so like sort of love the audience, but forget about the audience, I think is one way we think about it. I don't know if that's applicable to what you all do. May, to push back on me if you think I'm totally wrong. I, I think it's situation dependent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi Simon, I'm Ace. So building on that, we've talked about this a little bit already, but I really wanted to uh, like, zoom in on this, um, building with audiences, and uh, in your experience, what's the most important skill for making science of any kind accessible to the public? What's the most important component of that um, that you found? Yeah, I think, uh... I'll, I'll, I'll sort of go back to one of my earlier answers and just say, like, I think it, it's being able there's a confidence in being able to be stupid in front of very smart people. And uh, to be able to be stupid in a very smart way, to know when they're not quite articulating their, themselves well enough for the average person to be able to hear and for you to be able to jump in and say like, whoa, 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 sorry, I didn't quite understand that. Are you saying it this way? Or is this what you mean? Or is this what you mean? Because I'm not quite sure. Um, and that again is a, is a, can only happen when once you've really developed an ability to, to listen critically. So being a, being a critical listener. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, I guess kind of going off of that answer, um, because you do do a lot of research before you go into your interview, I guess is what I'm taking from what you've been saying. So usually, are you kind of playing devil's advocate? Like, do you actually kind of in a sense know what they're trying to say but trying to get them to just articulate it better um and when you do that how do you i guess not come across as fake i don't know how do you play that balance yeah good question um i'm totally playing devil like i i don't know if i'd ref i've i don't know if i would use the term playing devil's advocate but but certainly uh i'm making arguments that i don't agree with uh at times to push someone to more clearly articulate their argument or I'm even oftentimes times I'm playing dumb when I understand something or it's as strange it's as small a thing as like well I'm saying something like I hear that they bumped the microphone I might say like sorry I didn't quite understand that could you say that again just so we have like a clear piece of tape of them saying it um, and as far as like doing it in a way that doesn't feel over the top or performed like I think at least for me, like I, I approach interviewing as a sort of act of performance. Like I, I am a different person when I'm interviewing than I am in the rest of my life. I don't think I'm a, it, it's a version of myself. Like it's a slightly more heightened version, more excited version or more easily excited person. Uh, 
And, and as far as like, do I know what they're going to say when I enter the room? I, I'll oftentimes have a good idea. And if I do, then that gives me some lead time and prior to the interview to, to sort of uh, prepare a list of, of counter arguments for what I expect them to say. Uh, but at the same time, like you don't want to, or at least sort of the ethos here is you don't want to prep too much because you want to be able to have an actual genuine back and forth with the person and be present and allow yourself to think through something with them in any given moment. So yeah, it, it's, it's a, I think it's something you, you can only learn by doing and sort of dialing, dialing yourself in and how, how you want to be in that space, which is a totally unsatisfactory answer. And I'm sorry about that. Okay, real quickly, let, Geneva just popped in with a question that they wanted to ask. And then we'll get to yours for sure. Elaborate on training specifically. So maybe okay. the, yeah, the question is like, how did I, how did I learn how to do some of this stuff? Uh, like particularly cr critical listening. Um, and okay, so I didn't, I didn't study journalism. Uh, I have no background in it. I, when I was 20, 22, uh, I was living down in South America, uh, working at a couple restaurants, just trying to master the Spanish language. Uh, and while I was doing that, I realized like, what the hell am I going to do with my life? Uh, and thought like, you know, I like to write. I listened to a lot of public radio. I had played in bands, so I understood audio to a degree. Uh, and so I decided like, well, let's move somewhere new in Latin America and just try being a reporter, a free freelance reporter. And I knew that there were interesting things going on in Venezuela and that nobody or very few English speaking reporters were there. So I moved to Venezuela and just started pitching places, um, like going out, trying to find stories, pitching those story ideas to different editors until I eventually got picked up by uh, the BBC's The World. Uh, and from there, I moved to Ireland. I did that again, uh, working for an English speaking German radio show. Uh, and then from there I got, I got an internship here at the show. So like what, what can be learned from that? Uh, I think the most important thing is just to start, like if you, if, and not, not that you all want to be journalists, but just, uh, like you just have to start making stuff. You just have to start doing stuff and don't wait for somebody to, don't wait to get permission. Don't necessarily wait to have all of the skills before you start. Just you're going to learn stuff as you're probably going to learn things more quickly, potentially by just doing them. Um, so there's that aspect of it. I will say I showed up to the show here uh, and was totally like out of my depth. Like, uh, and I mean that in not just a journalistic way, but like I grew up in Wisconsin. I didn't get a great education. I went to a state school in Oregon for college and suddenly I'm with all these Ivy League assholes who think super fast and, uh, and are just way better read than me. And so it was like this three years of, uh, of just educating myself so that I could even have conversations with people. Uh, and so again, like there was a lot of self-education there. Uh, and I was surrounded by really as you all clearly are, uh, really smart, thoughtful people who were patient with me and helped me along the way. Um, so yeah, I, I think all, they're all very learnable skills. I don't think there's any sort of, yeah, I don't know if there's an innateness to it at all. The only other, one, one more thing I will say is I think the way I learned, and I didn't even know I was learning to be an interviewer, but the way I learned how to interview was like I hitchhiked a bunch in college. And when you're hitchhiking, like you're just sitting in the passenger seat and you have nothing to do but talk to the person and they're giving you a ride. So to a degree, I felt sort of indebted to them and the way I would pay them back was by asking them questions about like who they are, what they were up to. And uh, I think I honed that skill uh, in those long car rides. I don't know if I suggest that people do that or not, but uh, <laughs> it, it works. <laughs> Maybe one, yeah. one last one. Okay. Um, yeah. We, really quickly, do you have any stories, like Chris was saying, that were like failures or flops that like you, the audience like didn't pick the message, didn't pick up the message you were trying to get across or there was backlash or anything like that? Oh yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, no, the biggest one um, was this episode that we put out called Truth Trolls, uh, which got pulled down, which we ended up retracting. Uh, And essentially it was the story of 4chan trolling Shia LaBeouf and this art project he was doing and how through incredible wit, perseverance, and uh, critical thought, they were able to locate uh, where this where this flag was located, knowing nothing more than uh, a live stream video of the flag, and it's an incredible story. Like it, in and of itself, the fact that these guys managed to pull this off, I think, is it's incredible. Now, clearly, uh, where we failed was that we didn't cl- articulate clearly enough that there are a lot of bad actors on 4chan and that uh, it's even possible that some of the guys who ended up doing this were those bad actors. Um, And so for that reason, and also in part because the episode came out like the day before Charlottesville. So suddenly the national conversation and just the national mood changed in this very dark way and rightfully so it just, it even felt to us that what we had done was tone deaf. Um, what, I, what I think was important about that piece and what I'm th- continuing to strive to do, despite, and this, this sort of comes with the pushing the audience, is like, I think that bad, quote unquote, bad people uh, can still have rich, complicated, interesting lives. And that just because like I, I, I think you can you can present someone's story without glorifying the horrible views that they might have, and that's a really hard thing because like there's always going to be a good portion of the audience who thinks like you just shouldn't even give this person a platform, uh, which like I'm happy to have that argument, and I think you, the, whoever someone who was to articulate that like they have plenty of good arguments they could use. But I guess my, like, a principle I have is, like, it, it's better to see other people as human than not. And if I can find a, an iota of humanity in someone, it, it's not only worth presenting, but I think it's also just deeply interesting. Um, but, yeah, that was one that we, we missed the mark on in several ways. And we acknowledged it. Yeah, we fucked up. Cool. All right, well, we are out of time in our class. So um, first off, thank you very much for taking the time. So so, yeah, um, this was super interesting. And uh, I'll I'll send you a follow-up email. I guess I got to get some paper permission to post the recording, Cornell policy stuff. But uh, yeah, no, this was was awesome. And thank you very much. Cool, and I I don't think all Ivy Leaguers are assholes. (laughs) All right. Talk to you guys later. Yeah.